there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for tephalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for tephalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. Tefl Pioneers. For this episode's uh, Tefl Pioneer, I'd like to talk about Richard Schmidt, mm-hmm. um, who I was surprised that we hadn't spoken about him before. So he died about a year ago, almost a year ago, uh, in March of 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, I noticed we, hadn't, we didn't record a regular episode for a little while then. Maybe, maybe that's why we, we kind of missed out. Um, but I thought he'd be an appropriate person to discuss today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first of all, just give a little bit of biographical information, uh, mainly about his, his work, um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the aspects of his work that he's best known for. Mm-hmm. Um, so his, kind of, his career is kind of said to cover three main fields. One is uh, international service, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, he's kind of focused on linguistics in general earlier on, and then moved into applied linguistics and second language acquisition. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he got his BA at Harvard University. Pretty impressive. Yeah, in social relations. That's what he studied there. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what that is. It's a mix of international relations and sociology. Okay. Maybe, I don't know. In 1963. <laughs> uh, and then he worked as a U.S. Foreign Service Officer and Director of the J.F. Kennedy Cultural Center and Library in Beirut uh, in the mid to late 60s. He then went to Brown University to do his MA in 1971 and his PhD in 1974 uh, in linguistics, and he focused on the social linguistics of Arabic. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in 1976, um, he went and started working in the Department of English as a Second Language, later renamed Second Language Studies, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which mm. is the uh, institution he's most uh, commonly associated with. Mm. Uh, so, at his time at the University of Hawaii's ESL department, um, he, he was there when they started their PhD program in second language acquisition, um, which became what, one of the top programs of its type in the world. And he served as director of the UH National Foreign Language Center, sorry, National Foreign Language Resource Center uh, from 95 to 2011. Um, among his other accomplishments, he was chair of the Language Resource Center Council of Directors for two years. President of the American Association for Applied Linguistics from 2003 to 2004, and in 2009 received the Triple AL's Distinguished Service and Scholarship Award. Mm. Distinguished career. A very distinguished career. Um, he also spent a lot of his time engaged in um, teacher training. Um, he did projects in Japan, Thailand, Spain, Egypt, and Brazil. And his time in Brazil was as a Fulbright Scholar in Rio de Janeiro in 1983, mm-hmm. um, which maybe uh, leads on to one of his uh, most famous um, pieces of writing, article, which is, uh, the title is Developing Basic Conversation Ability in a Second Language, a Case Study of an Adult Learner of Portuguese. Mm-hmm. Punchy. Study. Yeah, <laughs> published, I think, in 1986. Um, and that, basically, that, that was written about his experience in Rio. Have, do you, are you familiar with this? Mm. Yes, we had to uh, read this, or I had to read this as a, uh, an assigned text when I joined um, a job once in, oh, really? in this very building. Okay, right. I don't, yeah, I don't think I've come across this. Okay. When I, by the time I joined, this was, <laughs> this was not part of They've it. moved on, you know. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I, th- I have read his work. Though. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is the... This is the I, I had heard about this paper before I read it, but it's the first kind of... Yeah, first contact I had with, with, with Schmidt. Um, so basically, he, he went to, um, to Portugal, to Rio, to, I guess, to, to help out with some teacher training, and he started keeping a language learning diary while he was there. Right. Um, and yeah, basically, he, he kind of tracked and, and journaled about his attempts to reach a sort of basic conversational level in Portuguese while he was there. Okay. Um, and then what he did afterwards is he sat down with a 
um, Brazilian linguist who's fluent in both Portuguese and English, and they um, recorded themselves speaking, and then this linguist kind of analyzed his language to, to notice features that were present and not present mm. and, and those kinds of things. Um, it's, it seems like the kind of um, thing that it's surprised, maybe surprising that more people in our field don't do mm. is, is journal about our own language learning experiences and, mm. and mm. kind of analyze it and, and reflect on it. Yeah, well, I think it's fairly surprising how many people in our field don't bother ever learning the language. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a bit of a gap. It's like it's kind of we're we're all language teachers in Japan, but we rarely do we talk about our own learning of Japanese. It's mm. kind of the. But I mean, aside from frustrated Facebook posts. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's not even the elephant in the room, really. Like it's not. I don't think people talk about it enough to be a kind of a. You know that like, we have friends that are successful language learners. That that doesn't always equate to effective teaching or vice versa maybe mm-hmm. but yeah it's, it's an interesting area mm-hmm. yeah so I guess I mean it covers a few things it's, it covers this idea of, of journaling and reflecting on mm-hmm. your experience as a learner but also I mean I think like you said anybody or not anybody but most language teachers who have been in the language classroom often afterwards will comment on you know the, the, the perspective it gives them of their students and how valuable that's been mm. um, yeah. have you have you I mean, we've probably talked about this before, but have you noticed that as a your experience as a language learner has informed your language teaching? You you have. You, I think you talked about on the podcast when you had lessons in a Japanese school. You kind mm. of you kind of almost wanted to tell them ways that they could um, improve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, no, I, I, yeah, I, I remember. Yeah, as you say, taking classes in a Japanese school, and a lot of the. Um, the approaches that they took, I felt, weren't very useful. Mm. Um, but I recognised doing that with my students as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, my students must have incredible patience because <laughs> I feel like flipping out on these teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember, I, I, it, was, it was really embarrassing. I went um, and, and complained, actually, to the, to the people because I thought, you know, I'm spending all this money and I'm getting this experience. Yeah. Um, and they knew what my job was. And they said, and this was, the phrasing of this stuck, uh, has stuck with me. Um, they said... Uh, but you know we've learned this from you, hmm. which is really odd. Yeah, they, and that's really bothered me. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I've woken up at night in a cold sweat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you think they mean you personally, or no, no, you no. as in the? They're, 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 I think they're really, they're yeah equating me with the the field. You know. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, it's and, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's an interesting idea actually. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I mean, he talks about one of it when he's. He, actually, the, the first part of his journal, journal is him just trying to kind of self te- you know, self-teach himself, um, just things that he notices around. And then he starts taking lessons, mm. and that obviously helps. But he, he has that very similar kind of experience um, to what you were talking about at first, which is when he's put in an advanced class, the teacher has them do drills. And so she asks, you know, in, in Portuguese, like, are you married? And he says, you know, yes, I am. He answers in Portuguese. And she says, no, 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 we're, we're practicing answering in the negative now. <laughs> or the, the other way around, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, and, and, he, and he also talks about, you know, um, testing hypotheses he has about the language by getting things intentionally wrong, but just to see how the teacher reacts to, to what he says. But the teacher getting kind of frustrated with him, like she, she knows that he's getting the answer wrong on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, so he describes this kind of sort of adversarial um, relationship he has with the teacher mm. from his perspective as a language teacher. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, but actually, the, the, the main bulk of the paper is this the second part where him and this uh, Portuguese linguist um, sit down and discuss things and, and his output is analyzed. And so, you know, noticing things like, um, I don't remember the details, but, you know, the, the Portuguese linguist noticed that he doesn't use certain very, very basic forms that you would expect in a certain amount of discourse for, for it to come up. Um, whereas other kind of more complicated structures he's, he's used and, and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and out of this, um, it, it seems like out of this came um, his maybe most well-known uh, kind of product as, a, as an applied linguistic, which is the noticing hypothesis. Are you familiar mm. with the, yeah. mm. the noticing hypothesis? Yeah, I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's most commonly cited um, from his 1990 paper, The Role of Consciousness in Second Language Learning. Um, but even in the in the eighty six paper about his language learning experience in Portugal, he uses words like notice and attention and, and these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, I think he he was going off of Krashen's ideas about input, um, and ha- getting the feeling that you know Krashen just talked about you need a lot of input and that's kind of enough. 
Um, but he felt that you need a little bit more. You, you, learners have to actually notice, whatever that means, mm. pay attention um, to grammatical features to really acquire them. So it kind of ties in with the idea of the zone of proximal development. They need, mm-hmm. they, they need to be just a little, like one step back or they need to be within a within an area that they can develop. Mm-hmm. So they, they need to notice what's what's lacking, I guess. For yeah, one yeah. Better words, right, or? right. Noti- yeah. So noticing a gap between in crash in terms like yeah. I yeah. between I and I plus one and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So he, I think, was importantly pointed out that noticing alone isn't enough. Um, no- noticing doesn't automatically um, lead to language acquisition. Would you um, say it's a, a necessary but not sufficient condition? Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a necessary con- condition. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So you, you do need it. Um, but there's, there's um, also a lot of debate about it. So mm. what, what do you think in general about the noticing hypothesis? We have spoken about it before, I think. Mm. I, so it, it's difficult um, to say, actually, in, in terms of relating to my own experience, mm. because there are some times when I produce language which I don't remember having consciously noticed. Mm. But... I might have done and then forgotten about it. Sure. <laughs> and there are other times when I've, I've noticed something yeah. and gone out of my way to explicitly learn it and then not, not remembered it. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously it's very difficult to extrapolate from your own experiences, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not completely sure. Mm. I don't, is it a thing that you can actually talk about? Like, I mean, it's, it's consciousness, right? But yeah. really yeah. it's kind of an unconscious thing. The, the, when you notice and don't notice like in talking about it you're obviously noticing it but actually you're probably it probably works on a whole other subconscious level yeah I, th- I mean I think that's some of, maybe too. some of the criticism of the hypothesis um, is this idea of yeah basing it in consciousness and what, and what does that really mean yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe also that's not really based on any firm um, theory of language acquisition or second language acquisition right. yeah. um, well, I mean, like the the what you're talking about is is more like the input hypothesis, and mm-hmm. all that you need is the input, and it, there isn't any con- any attention paid to conscious noticing in that, right? Um, whereas this is saying it's not enough to just be exposed to input; you have to also notice things in the input mm-hmm. in order for that to affect mm-hmm. your developing linguistic right, system. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's yeah. So, so it's part of the criticism is even within that, it's not necessarily based on. Mm. Yeah, but I don't think even Krashen's thing is necessarily based yeah, on... Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> on, yeah, on hard I don't think any second language acquisition is based on... Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so some people uh, argue that maybe it should be limited to talking about just metalinguistic knowledge rather mm. than actual uh, language Yeah, yeah, yeah that's kind of what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, I mean, that raises a question about the, the learning acquisition gap, right? Mm. So I think against Krashen, right, who says... Um, you know, you, learning language is different from acquiring language because learning leads to uh, sort of explicit knowledge, and language, uh, sorry, acquisition leads to more uh, sort of uh, I don't know, communicative knowledge or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, how does that fit in with that? Because noticing would imply learning rather mm-hmm. than that acquisition, which is more of a subconscious thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I think the overall the the idea is that. The, the final goal or the final result is acquisition in terms of mm. communicative competence. Um, yep. Um, I, I've, I'd never met Schmidt. Um, yeah, he certainly definitely spent time in Japan and, and he, in the kind of in, introduction to that paper about his language learning uh, experience in Brazil, he talks about his um, awareness of other languages and he you know, mm, yeah. picked up a few phrases of Japanese here and there his Arabic apparently was quite good he spent quite a bit of time there mm. and studied it at a he, many linguistic level he, aside from working with J.D. Brown he seems to have a similar kind of ethos regarding learning of other languages didn't J.D. Brown talk about his learning of well, he talked about French right mm. and how yeah. that, that was what got mm. him into teaching right yeah. and I think he was also in the army too yeah it was, so, I think it was yeah. being in the army that um, he said it, it uh, it made him realise what he didn't want to do, right? Right, and he started, right yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, he had the discipline to go and do his studies and that kind of thing. Yeah, so there's some similarities, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of men that age probably had similarities. <laughs> yeah. Um, but j- just reading, you know, a lot of the um, kind of tributes and obituaries written about him a year ago, apparently he was clearly a very, very well-liked man. 
um, very open-minded, very uh, visionary in, in terms of uh, the people he worked with and the, and the way he conducted himself. Uh, so that's uh, our, our Tefology tribute to uh, Richard Schmidt. Tefl News. Okay, so for this next section, this Tefl News section, I'd like to talk about um, uh, some conferences that took place recently. Now, it's kind of conference, it's always conference season, let's be honest. Every time of year, mm. there's, there's conferences around the world. I think at this time of year in Southeast Asia, there's a number mm. of conferences that go on in January, February, and March, I think. Yep. Um, I wasn't at any of those conferences. Oh. <laughs> um, but someone who was is um, former uh, interviewee, mm. Anna Losseva. Mm. And uh, last week, I recorded a, a chat with Anna Losseva, which I'm going to play to both of you now. Okay. So after you've listened, I'd like to get your reflections. Sure. Okay, so here's our chat. Hello. Hello. Hello, Anna. Thanks for, um, yeah, thanks for agreeing to come here today. Sure. Um, so I, I sort of learned recently that you'd been to um, a couple of conferences in Southeast Asia, in uh, yes. Thai Tiso and mm-hmm. Cam Tiso. Yes. And um, yeah, I just thought today for this news section on the podcast, I'd mm-hmm. just ask you how, how were your experiences? Um, so maybe f- firstly, um, when, when were the conferences? When, when did they take place? Uh, Thai Tiso was... Uh, in Chiang Mai on January 26th, 27th, mm-hmm. as far as I remember. And uh, Kem Tiso was 10th, 11th of February. Okay. So that was a nice nice way to combine both conferences. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, at these conferences, did you present at all? Oh, yes, I presented uh, twice. So okay. once at each, pres- at each conference. Uh, for, for, uh, can you tell us what you presented about? Yeah, I talked example? about uh, the w- I talked about the, my experience of online reflective journaling. Mm-hmm. Okay. Basically, I've had a couple of situations cases mm. that I reflected on mm-hmm. myself in this year, so I want to share that. Right. I and I created a Facebook group. Uh, if uh, any listeners are interested in that, I'm going to plug it in quickly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's that called? Yeah, so uh, it's called Partners for Reflective Journaling. So for people, teachers who are interested in exploring mm. that the professional development technique mm-hmm. are welcome to join and look for partners to do journaling uh, with right. a peer. Okay. And um, at, when, you, when you presented about this at the conference, how, mm-hmm. how was it received by the local attendees? Uh, yeah, m- my sessions did not have so many participants in them, about 10 each. Uh, but those people who came seemed to be into it. Mm-hmm. And um, a couple of them joined the group afterwards, which was nice. But yeah, generally the... Uh, they were well received, and it was not a. I think it's not a complicated topic, mm-hmm. but maybe yeah. because of the sessions, this is an interesting uh, idea. Maybe to keep in mind for conference organizers and conference participants, too, yeah. that the idea yeah. that if a session uh, takes thirty minutes, uh, it's really not enough time to mm-hmm. make it a workshop. Okay. Uh, and I think both Tai Sol and Kam Sol, if I'm not mistaken, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, it's supposed to be a workshop. And this uh, limits <laughs> what right, you can okay. do. 30 minutes is not enough. Yeah, so I yeah. felt like it was well received, but there were so many things that I wanted to do and wanted to say and the message I wanted to convey that I did not have the space to do. Yeah, I see. Mm. Yeah. And um, Thai Tiso and Cam Tiso, I guess they're both very different from each other. But how, yeah. how, did, how did your experiences with those conferences compare to your, your previous experiences? Mm. So uh, those two were the first two conferences I went to in Southeast Asia. Okay. So that was really interesting for me to compare with. Uh, I'd been I'd previously been to conferences in France and Russia and Turkey and Korea and Japan. So overall, <laughs> yeah. East yeah. Asia yeah. and uh, European part. And I have to say that I left. Uh, Kempty Soul specifically left mm-hmm. me feeling most energized. Oh, okay, all right. Well, yeah. Let's let's talk about that one then. <laughs> what 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 in particular? Yeah, I, uh, it's hard to say because maybe part of it is because I love Cambodia so much, mm. and I find people mm-hmm. in general in this country are very welcoming and friendly and yeah. smiling, and that yeah. somehow transfers to what teachers are like. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so, right. uh, it was amazing to me to to see so many 
teachers who were genuinely engaged. There were uh, teachers who came from provinces, from small schools mm-hmm. uh, in faraway areas, and their campus all offers um, scholarships and helps teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is an opportunity when you submit a, your proposal, you can uh, support the teachers. So. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. To come. I think this is a really so, nice so your, initiative. Your fee goes to directly or indirectly to. You can you can uh, Cambodian teachers don't have to pay so much mm-hmm. as international uh, participants. Right, okay. But uh, anyone can support, and you can uh, pay extra money to support a local teacher. Mm, okay. And so right. that's. I think this is a nice initiative yeah. for any place, in fact, <laughs> yeah. for any country, yeah. but Cambodia in particular, and uh, yeah. you. You could see, like, in the coffee breaks, uh, in the coffee break time, in the hall, you could see so many of those teachers just... They were so eager to talk. They did not approach me (laughs) first. Mm. But it was clear that if I come up and say hi, they were just so ready to start talking (laughs) about teaching and start talking in English. And their English is uh, is really good. And they're just really eager to be like that. Not only in coffee breaks, but also... In the sessions themselves. Do you, and like in terms of like a percentage of um, local Cambodian teachers and I guess like international teachers that are not from Cambodia, mm-hmm. what was the kind of the makeup of the uh, the conference? Yeah, I felt like um, it's really difficult for me to differentiate uh, between Cambodian and uh, teachers from Vietnam or Laos or okay, <laughs> Thailand, yeah, yeah, sure, but yeah, there were yeah. but. Mm, there were a lot of Vietnamese teachers yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. also from Laos and and Thailand not so much maybe, but yeah I think that maybe there were lots of Cambodian teachers mm-hmm. and especially what surprised me was that there were lots of male teachers male school teachers. <laughs> right. right. Um, yeah. But yeah it was really fascinating to see to be honest and they all wore the best suits they had <laughs> they looked so oh, great right, okay. and they were yeah. so happy. To, to interact and uh, mm. in the sessions this is another important thing I think uh, in the sessions that where I was a participant and we were doing some some group work they were so ready to start <laughs> talking nobody okay. was uh, holding back and they were really ready to short, share your opinions and yeah. think about the yeah. questions and do the activities it's very yeah. there was very positive uh, yeah. Atmosphere. Well, was was there like a, a theme? Because there's a conference often have these kind of loose themes. Yeah. Was there a theme to, or, or or who were the plenary speakers? If there were any, or there weren't, there weren't any. <laughs> no, there were uh, plenary oh, speakers. But I okay. I did go to one plenary. I think yeah, uh, it's a famous uh, name that I don't remember. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Right. Uh, but the theme was uh, both conferences. I mm. think. The theme was something about digital era. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I think. Yeah, digital yeah. era. Okay. So my topic of online <laughs> journaling mm. fit in well, and I think many, maybe uh, many sessions tried to fit in the theme. Yeah. But Camp Tissot was interesting also in that there were so many sessions. Honestly, I did not expect so many <laughs> because there were lots of threads, mm. uh, or like the sessions types, right? right? Uh, and uh, for example, professional professional development section, the one that I'm most interested in, mm. had three sessions, two or three sessions going on in three different rooms at the same time, which means that there were lots of sessions right, on this okay. theme. Right, right, and uh, yeah, I guess like yeah, f- what I wanted to find out finally was um, what what did you learn from someone else's presentation that you went to? Were there any particular points of interest that you remember from? like watching someone else's presentation. Oh, yeah. I wanted to say that mm. uh, the first day of Camp Soul, after the first plenary, I went to three sessions. The sessions, mm-hmm. as I said, last 30 minutes. This is one sort of negative point for me. Yeah. Uh, but it helps many teachers present, uh, of course. And those two of those sessions were about reflective practice. Uh, one teacher from Phnom Penh, from Cambodia, teacher, teacher, trainer, mentor, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and one from Malaysia. They shared the experience of what they do with the mm-hmm. other teachers. That was a really great. And even if in some cases uh, some of that information was not new to me, mm-hmm. but the way it was presented and the, yeah. the references and some of the, some of the tools that they use, some activities they use, that was new to me and... And overall, because people were so passionate about it, mm-hmm. and present presentations were 
well conducted. Mm -hmm. You know, I did. I never felt like, oh, I'm wasting my time. (laughs) It was always worthwhile. And one more presentation that I really, really enjoyed so much was um, about teaching low literacy refugee students in New York. That was just totally new to me. Yeah. And yeah. fascinating and so emotional and really yeah. wonderful session. And the perfect presenter, the name I do not remember, okay. of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But her she said that her mentor is John Fanzelow, so uh-huh. okay. <laughs> that was interesting. And he'll he'll be our next interviewee, actually. Right. On this. So yeah. That's, that's, that's good. A bit of synergy there. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Well, um yeah, thanks Anna. Thanks for that. Just a very short talk, but uh, thank you for coming. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've just listened to uh, my my conversation with Anna. Um mm-hmm. any any thoughts? Um well, I I had two things okay. that I wanted, that, that I thought were kind of interesting. Um so first of all, it was actually in one of the questions you asked. Yeah. You, you mentioned, um, you, you were asking a question about international teachers and you qualified that with not from Cambodia. Yeah. And that, that kind of struck me in terms of how we, how we talk about teachers in, in the kind of the conference sort of circuit. So, you know, like the, we've got the, the local teachers and the international teachers. Mm-hmm. Do we talk about the same, do we talk about it in the same way when we're in, like, um, you know, if it was TESOL in the US, mm. would we still say the local teachers and the international teachers, or would it be different? I mean, you've, you've been, I guess. Mm. So. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, I think we might, actually. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah. Yeah, possibly. Mm. International teachers might mean all the non-Americans. In right, case. right. Yeah, it was, it was just kind of, yeah. I, was, I was thinking about it. I was diff- mm. Yeah, I was, I was being careful not to say the native and the non-native because that's not a good dichotomy. And also, the native would mean Cambodian teachers, arguably, would it not? But the natives but of Cambodia. Also, <laughs> then it also has other meanings, too. So it's quite a problematic. Uh, right. yeah, so yeah, I, was trying, yeah. I was trying to sort of uh, differentiate between the local, you know, the local teachers, the mm. working local Cambodian teachers and the, the others that have kind of come in and yeah, have yeah. different jobs. And I mean, like, it's yeah. an international conference, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah, like going back to TESOL, I, I found myself afterwards when I was talking about it. So the biggest difference for me at TESOL was the number of uh, teachers based in America, basically. Mm-hmm. I guess, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, I don't remember exactly the terminology I would have used, but maybe maybe local or maybe just US based. But I guess a big difference also is that they would be mostly teaching in ESL contexts, mm-hmm. which is right. different from, from us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you have another point, Matt? Do you have any Yeah, points? I have a second okay. point. So, th- so this is a, more of a, a kind of a, a discussion one. So, um, so Anna, it seems to me, was focusing a lot more on the atmosphere of the conference than on the, the, the content of the conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that seems to be quite a, sort of a common theme. You know, people go to, people always comment on, oh, there was a really good atmosphere, and I met all these people, and I had And I was wondering, what, what do you think is more important for teachers when they're going to conferences? Do you think it is the content, or do you think it's more the atmosphere and the, the sense of, of, you know... It's tricky. Like, I, I still would leave a conference disappointed if I hadn't gone to many sessions that I feel like I learned something from or got something out of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, in, like, in terms of the atmosphere, if I go, if I travel to a, another country for a conference, I'm probably thinking more about <clears throat> my experience in that city or in that country mm-hmm. as a whole rather yeah, than just yeah, what happens yeah. at the conference venue. So there's kind of those two things going on at the same time. But in terms of the conference itself, I'm probably more interested in the content of the, the presentation. And you're going to yeah. Singapore soon. Yeah, so that's we, right. So we might ask you about that when you, when you return. Okay. Yeah. Matt, did yeah. you have any thoughts that you wanted to... Um, I, yeah, I mean, just this idea of comparing, comparing conferences and different types of conferences. Um, and I think, I mean, that could, it could potentially be an interesting project. You know, yeah. Yeah. somebody who has attended... I don't know. I mean, that, I'm, besides, like, the usual, like, the Scott Thornbury's and the people who are invited to speak at different conferences every, you know, fortnight, um, I wonder if there are people who, you know, just out of their own pocket or using their, their research money um, to visit as many different conferences around the world. And um, people who have had that experience and, you know, you, you wouldn't want a comparison to be too critical, I guess. Mm-hmm. That, that might just be weird or, you know, bitter. But it would be interesting to, to hear a... Um, you know, somebody has experience of many different conferences in many different continents to, to talk mm, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that was today's Tefl News. Um, Anna <laughs> talking about conferences she'd been to. Tefl.
TEFL cultures. Today's TEFL culture is about doing a PhD in TESOL and Applied Linguistics. Um, and so uh, this, this is kind of contextual bringing this up, uh, so because I've, I've just recently finished my PhD, which actually makes me um, an officially certified Tefalologist now, <laughs> rather than self-certified. Yeah, um, well, you're out of our gang. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can be in our gang anymore. You're too qualified. <laughs> And, and Matt, you're uh, applying for a PhD. Yeah, literally, as we record this, I'm maybe one day away from submitting my proposal, which already stands at almost 8,000 words. Yeah. So um, I've gone above and beyond. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's longer than mine was. And, and Matt, I, yeah, I, I can spell PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Your pronouns are PhD. Actually, every, PhD. every time I go to write PhD, I have to think about, is it a big P or a small P, a big H or a small H? Right. And I have to check. Confuse it with pH balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd, we'd talk about this. Um, and maybe this seems like a, a niche subject, um, but I think that there are some, some interesting points here, um, especially because, you know, there is this kind of qualification inflation, which is mm. probably probably my least favourite. Arms favorite race, the... people say as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've messed up my joke. No. I was, was going to say, qualification inflation, probably my least favourite pavement album. Um, so okay. the, I'd like to cover a few different points. The first one would be, why bother? Um, and I've had a lot, I had a lot of uh, scepticism about this expressed to me. Mm -hmm. um, so why bother doing it? Um, mm. And then the, the kind of the process of doing it. Um, and then finally, what can you do with it? Mm. You know? Um, so, so first of all, why why bother? So, Matt, Matt you're uh, applying for your PhD. Yeah. Why? Um, What's the point? <laughs> yeah, and that's. I mean, you could do a whole PhD on that topic, right? I mm. guess as well. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's it's professionalism. It's continuing professional development. Um, I want to. I want to get a full time job somewhere. So, so yeah. So within. Within the context of Japan, it's it um, could lead to a more permanent position, perhaps a bit more responsibility, a bit more money, mm -hmm. and also I found an area of interest that I really like, right. and I think it has legs, and I think it will keep me interested for five years. Yeah, mm. but I'd be lying if I didn't say that um, money and a better <laughs> job position was not a reason for doing it. Mm. Right, right. Any, uh... So I should talk about why not, I guess. I guess. Uh, sure, yeah. yeah, go for it. Um, just because my context is I've not yet decided to apply for one, um, although it's something I've, I anticipate doing in the future, but I've, I don't know if put it off is the right word, mm. exactly. Um, but for me, it's, 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 basically, it's mainly the money, the reason that I haven't applied for one yet. Mm. Um, they cost a lot of money. That's true. <laughs> um, and... It's not really an excuse because I think there's no there's probably no good time to do one, mm. and um, it's not it doesn't need to be considered an excuse anyway. <laughs> it's like a, if you choose it, you know there's no necessarily reason to do one. No, but I mean, but I mean, if if you do want to do one, and, right. But you haven't yet. Um, the I get. I mean, timing is maybe part of it. Um, I have two somewhat small children mm -hmm. that take up all my free time currently, um, and a job that you know takes up a considerable amount of, of time. Um, but at the same time, you know, I know plenty of people who have started their PhDs, you know, as their third child is being born, for example. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you make time for it, no, no matter what your situation is. I mm. think. Yeah. I, I was talking to someone recently, and they was, yeah, it was interesting. They were like, oh, I, I haven't found anything that interests me enough to want to put all that money mm -hmm. behind it in time. Yeah. So Yeah, that's another reason. And then also, it. equally, there's another group of people that just join a PhD program and don't really have an end in sight or a a clear mm -hmm. goal so there's a few different ways to kind of come at it, different um, sort of understandings of what they want out of it I think maybe yeah I think it might be worth um, just just uh, discussing a little bit about the different systems for doing a PhD yeah, yeah. Um, so the the American system is generally you you apply to a program and you spend a few years on coursework quite often earning a master's degree along the way mm. um, and then you spend the last few years doing your project and writing up in um, a European and specifically in a British one, uh, for, from our point of view, um, you you apply directly with a proposal for your final project, you, and you don't generally do any coursework, and then you just do the whole thing on your own. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference being, you're usually expected to have a master's degree to apply, mm -hmm. whereas you don't usually have to have that for a, for an American style PhD. But some people do a PhD straight after an MA as well; mm -hmm. they go straight onto it. Yeah. Um, 
In Japan, I'm not quite sure. It seems like it's somewhere in the middle. Mm. I've like I've got a colleague who's doing his PhD, um, and he's doing it with a supervisor about a particular interest. But part of his PhD requires him to write two refereed articles, mm. which go towards his final um, thesis, I guess, or yeah. points. I, I don't know. That yeah. seems to be something that's quite common in the natural sciences. That you're yeah. you're, you're yeah. working on a project and you produce papers which get published, and then your your thesis is more like a collection of your papers, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I didn't have to do that because my project was an ethnography. So you can't really slice it up into papers very easily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned that in the British model and the one that you did, it's more, you know, you have an idea and then you basically go off and do it, you said, on your own. Yeah. To what extent do you get support from the university? Well, you get, um, you, uh, to the extent that you want it, I think. I mean, I, I did mine, not, not by distance, but part-time, and I was living in Japan, so I, I went back to the UK once a year and, you know, mm. that kind of thing. And I had lots of Skype meetings and stuff. Mm. Um, but there were, like, you know, I, I, if I didn't, bother contacting my examiner, he wasn't going to contact me. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's however much you want, essentially. But the idea is that you're meant to be autonomous, um, which I think is another difference between the British and the, the kind of the, the US model, is mm. that you're expected to be autonomous straight off the bat. You know, you yeah. can go straight in. And Do you have kind of set deadlines along the way, or is it really just open? Oh, uh, you, you have set deadlines, mm. yeah. But I think, I mean, this is the other thing. Uh, I think doing um, a PhD at different institutions and different projects is so different mm. that it, it, there's not really a meaningful comparison between them, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so mine was, was for an applied li- linguistics PhD, it was very atypical. It was basically more like a sociology mm. uh, project, a, sociolo- a sociology of applied linguistics <laughs> project, I guess. Okay. Um, I, was, yeah. I was talking to someone the other day as well, and they were saying, oh, you're doing an online PhD. I was like, well, it's not really online. You You communicate online, but it's not... Mm. An online PhD, so there's a bit of kind of not people aren't really sure. Is about. it is it considered distance? Well, n- not really. You're you're either considered like full time or part time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or and you're just considered as a researcher, like wherever you are in the world, yeah, I yeah. guess. And um, another thing that uh, for like, I've got an American friend who I was talking about uh, with this last week, he said that he um would like to do a UK PhD, but he doesn't have a home address in the UK, mm. which means the price would be astronomical. Mm. Yeah. So that puts off a lot of people as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think there's... So that's something for our field to sort of consider. There, there is still a stigmatisation of distance learning. I, I did my master's degree by distance. Mm. I never went to the campus. Mm. Um, but, you know, how realistic is it to expect people in a in a profession where you generally are working in another country to, mm. to be doing that kind of thing. And, it, and I guess in the UK, distance learning has more of a tradition, you know, mm. like the Open University is very re- well respected. Most universities have respected distance learning programs. Mm. And I guess I, I, I get the impression that in the US there's more of a stigma attached to it. Do you, do you get that? Feeling? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, there are, there are a few kind of well-known you know, online universities which are not considered mm. real universities. Right. Maybe, maybe th- those kind of institutions have, have Colored people's opinion. Mm. Right, right. But I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of, you know, very good, legitimate uh, distance programs in the States as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's... I think for people like us, the most common route is to do it part-time yeah. from a distance and yeah. work slowly on your project over a number of years. Mm. And how, yeah. how long is it, on average, how many years? Oh, again, it depends on the program. From, um, how about from your experience? For, well, for me, it took four years. Okay. Um, but... I've heard that some people, I think Ken Highland did his in two and a half years or something. Uh, I read in his book. Um, and and some people, you know, go on for seven or eight or nine years, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really depends, right. I think. Right. Uh, and of course, if you've got like mandatory coursework for three years, then that's, uh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. that's extending it <laughs> out as well. Um, so do, do you know how PhDs are assessed? I mean, obviously you write your thesis mm-hmm. and then do you know what the, the end part of it is? You have like a a, a defence. Is that an American term? A defence. It's a viva a viva voce or a viva voce. That's the same uh-huh. as a defence. Right? It's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's yeah. just a better name for it. Right. So that's like <laughs> it basically means you you have to speak in person about. Yeah. You get scrutinised about your work and mm-hmm. you have to defend it. Is that the wrong term? I, I guess. Yeah. I guess it's correct. But yeah. yeah. You have yeah. a varied number of examiners. Different places have different rules, and you have to defend your thesis. And again, this is different from country to country. Apparently, 
in the American system. Um, once you get to that stage, the vibe is more more like formality, is what I've heard. You know, mm. I'm, I'm, I I don't know if it's necessarily true, but it's more of a formality. It's more you know, if you're at that stage, then the supervisor decided that you're not going to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whereas in the UK, I think it's a much bigger <coughs> thing, and there's a, a higher tendency for people to to flunk that mm -hmm. or have to resubmit, and they get you know six mm -hmm. months to rewrite sections of their thesis. And you don't you don't get a grade, do you? You either pass or fail. Right. Right. Okay. Did you have to defend your MA thesis no. dissertation? Is that a thing that? In, in when I did my MA here in Japan, I had to. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, it was. Yeah, I don't. It wasn't necessary formality at that point because I know people on the same course were given feedback, which meant they had to go off and mm. do a lot more work on it. Right. Um, but yeah, it was may maybe a similar thing. I was questioned mm. about aspects of it. And right. Right. Explain right. It, which yeah. I, yeah I, maybe I thought. I, yeah, this is unusual. Yeah. Masters. I think like with my with my Viva, um, I got minor corrections, okay. uh, which apparently is like the most common. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you go away and you have to you have three months to rework sections of it, and then you can have major corrections or you can have resubmission. Um, so, or or fail. Uh, I think usually it's resubmission. Resubmission is like it just doesn't work at all, mm. right? <laughs> like, okay. And you've got to completely rework it. So mm. the question I have is how how common is that? I mean, I think people would assume that it wouldn't get to that point mm. if it is that flawed yeah. based on, on feedback from a supervisor but it, hope, it, yeah yeah I think so I've heard that occasionally a supervisor might let it get that far just because they're sick of the student they just want they, it's a way of making the student wash out essentially hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think that's common hmm. I think it's more likely that you'll get someone in your viber who unbeknownst to you completely disagrees with your idea mm -hmm. um, and you try to avoid that you know because you can recommend people to like be your examiner selecting for jury duty right yeah. exactly yeah. Um, so I think it, it can happen but it's it's more of an accidental kind of thing okay. um, yeah so I, I'm sure there are people who would look at my thesis and, and completely you know destroy it because <laughs> it's not what they do mm -hmm. and that's fine you know um, would that not then be the pers the kind of person you'd want to defend it to? <laughs> no. You want someone who's at least, you know, uh, friendly to your ideas in theory, right? right you don't want right. someone who is completely <laughs> philosophically opposed to what you're doing because there are, there are lots of different schools of thought in these subjects. Yeah. But would that then not give you a space to really sort of get into your beliefs? Mm. Like if it's someone that kind I of mean, already has similar similarly aligned beliefs, is that not... Pushing you. Presumably, yeah, whatever it's like pushing you, you maybe I don't know. Right, presumably, presumably whatever approach you, you take yeah. is through a certain critical lens or through, right. through a yeah, yeah, and if they're not looking at through the same anyway. lens, then it's it's exactly. not talking on the same topic. Yeah, really. exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. this isn't like the hard sciences, you know, in terms of mind, where yeah. you're you know you're you're not um, they're not going to be sitting there and saying you know you've you've done the statistical analysis wrong. You know, it's not like that kind of thing. No, it's no. I have a completely different <laughs> set of ideological assumptions to what you have, mm -hmm. and therefore. I'm not accepting this piece of work, yeah, you know, yeah. and you get that with journals. Yeah, yeah. But with this, you know, the idea is that you've t you've chosen a perspective and you've done a piece of work, and it's whether you've done an acceptable piece of work within that perspective. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of the the process of doing the PhD. Mm -hmm. So what can you do with a PhD? Um, what would what would you say? Go on a podcast and tell everyone you've done one. <laughs> <laughs> Wave it in our faces. Yeah, I've not done that for a while. Um, I, so I think it goes back to who your supervisor is. So if you've, if you've um, perhaps if you've chosen a supervisor that you like the work of, mm. I think after you've done your PhD, there's there's the possibility of continuing the, the research together, maybe. Mm. Mm. Um, that's that was that's something that I'm kind of thinking about. Like, where after this is there going to be a kind of a dialogue and yeah yeah. So you're thinking basically continuing in academia. <clears throat> Yeah, I think so. I think it like a springboard onto other things. I mm. guess. Yeah, you know, you often see doctoral thesis, sis, theses, theses, yeah. um, referenced in articles. So mm. I think people do read what you've written, and you know. Yeah. yeah. People pretend. People read the abstract and pretend they've read the whole thing. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Obviously, a big part of it is many universities will only hire. Yeah. Um, yeah. People for you know, tenure positions or tenure track positions if they have a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in yeah. a relevant field. Yeah, so I think academia is, is one route, but mm. I think at the moment, because there is such a uh, profusion of PhD uh, graduates, mm. and there isn't 
the same growth of plate. In fact, there's a shrinkage of mm. plate of spaces, you know, of mm. tenure track positions. Yeah. Um, people are doing. I think it's called alt alt academia, something okay. like that. Um, different kinds of careers where you you know you do your PhD and then you go into doing something else. So you can do independent scholarship where you basically do like the conference circuit and write books and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you continue doing academia but not within the academy. Okay. Um, <coughs> there's also uh, consulting. Um, so two recent mm-hmm. examples uh, of people in applied linguistics who've taken this route are. Uh, Bill Van Patten, mm-hmm. um, who are you know our rival podcast. <laughs> that, that podcast actually ended. Yes, it ended because he has. Oh, he's left. The, he's left the university yeah. to oh. to go into. So he resigned his professorship in order to go into kind of online oh, consulting right, okay. and that kind okay. of thing. Yeah. Um, and Simon Borg uh, also resigned his uh, professorship to uh, to go into being a freelance language consultant. So right. So d- doing that kind of freelance work. Do you, I mean, is a, how valuable is a PhD to, to further that kind of work? Do you I think? think, well, I mean, it, it depends what you do your PhD in. Um, right. I mean, the, what's, what's interesting about these two is that they've both done it after establishing themselves as experts. It might be a bit different if you're going straight in. Um, but I think it, it adds a bit of credos, credos, sure, credos sure. whatever, to your, uh, to your name, you uh-huh. know. Um, if you think about David Crystal, you know, I remember in your section you said he basically rented out a, a room and put up a sign saying, you know, language consultant, and sure, yeah, people yeah. came to him. Yeah. So I think if you're a doctor, whatever, then yeah. that, that helps with yeah. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And your research might be particularly relevant to that. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you've done research in second language acquisition, then you could set up um, an app or a company or something like that mm-hmm. where you're, you're using that knowledge. Um, if it's in something like my topic, then you can't do that, and you've wasted your life. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So there's a yeah, there's a few different things you can do, I think. And I guess the fact that PhDs are so closely connected to academia means people maybe don't think about those alternative pathways. But I think it it's worth thinking about that because it's not the be, working in university is not the only path you can take with a yeah. PhD these days. Right. What What do you think completing a PhD or having a PhD I mean, I mean, obviously people who haven't done one don't necessarily know, but, or, but what do you think, I guess, what, what do you think you've learned from it or gained from it? Or what do you think having done one shows about what you're capable of? Well, uh, I don't know what it shows about what I'm capable of. <laughs> Murder. Um, but I think, <laughs> no, but, you, but you've gone through the process, so you know right. what you had to do to, to be able to finish it. Yeah, well, I think it's, um, I, I actually don't, I don't think your PhD says anything, I don't think having a PhD says anything about how smart you are. I think it's, it's how good you are at sticking with something and, mm, and finishing okay. it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm That's quite, an important quality. It, it is, yeah. In many fields, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, um, I, I asked you the other day, I said, has, has doing a PhD made you a better writer? And you, what did you say? You said, not necessarily, but it's made you a more, um, what did you say? More disciplined. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm definitely, I can sit down and write now for like four hours in a row and uh, that kind of thing, which I couldn't do before, really. Do you think it's improved your ability to kind of critically analyze yeah, yeah, things, yeah. Uh, I mean, especially within... I think so. Well, I, so I think doing, going through the process, you, you have to do certain things. Maybe you don't realize it's so incremental. Mm-hmm. You don't realize what you're doing. But certainly um, your knowledge of the field, of, of your corner of the field, mm-hmm. expands a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, your knowledge of the tools that people use to analyze things mm-hmm. uh, in different areas expands a lot. And you know, in the specific area you've chosen expands mm-hmm. a lot. Um, and I think generally it will improve your critical thinking skills, so that's good, I guess. Sure. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it's difficult, but again, it, they're so different to each other that, oh. that yeah, there's no, there's no one takeaway. That's why I didn't want to make this section about me particularly, mm-hmm. but about, you know, the idea of the, doing the PhD in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think they're worth doing. I think that, you know, not, not for everyone, but if you want mm-hmm. to do them, then it's worth doing. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, this episode's TEFL Culture, doing a PhD in TESOL or Applied Linguistics. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. Don't forget you can email us at teflology at gmail.com, follow us on Twitter at teflology, follow us on Facebook at uh, Teflology Podcast. You can also now listen on Spotify, SoundCloud, and you can also stream our episodes through YouTube as well. Um, That's it. So um, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye.